there are not enough black advisors. It's not seen as a career route. There's lack of government and party support for what we do. In 1988, um, there was a cooperative development agency in every major city in the UK. There are about 12 in London. I was the chair of the National Network of Black Business Advisors. It was 140 strong. I think at the moment we'd be hard pressed to find 12 black cooperative advisors. So I've seen things, I would argue that I've seen things go backwards. Support and infrastructure matters if you're trying to attract people. Exposure matters. Normalising matters. We need organisations that are de dedicated to cooperative promotion and education. They're called cooperative development agencies, but we have fewer of them than we used to. And we can't afford to be oblivious to this because this maintains the myth that democratic choice is equally available to all, but it is not. So how do we recognize the ways that co-ops perpetuate institutionalized racism and engage in racist microaggression and exclusion? We have to really examine our own assumptions and practices because sometimes I think we are guilty of perpetuating things without even necessarily realizing. And we need to examine how co-ops actually operate and the unintentional outcomes sometimes. And how do we get people to stop being exclusive well, I would argue that first we need to listen, really listen. We need to listen to what people have to say. We have to listen to their lived experience and we have to learn from that lived experience. And we need to build that into our policies, into our arguments, into our procedures. We need to listen and not impose. And there are times when, um, if we're talking about this in the terms of a black white um, context, there are times when white people just need to take themselves out of the picture you know, you need to think, you need to listen to what other people have to say. Let me give you an example. It's International Women's Day. I've been asked to speak at a women in co-ops event. There's perhaps 150 people at the event. There are maybe seven black women in the room, including me. And I think I'm probably being generous in that estimate. I'm a keynote speaker on the day. I've been asked to speak about racial injustice and oppression that I have faced over the years about so I speak about being held back, about being told that I couldn't succeed, the fact that I fought every step of the way. I talked about institutionalized racism and how it affects us as people of color. I talked about the self-fulfilling prophecies that, help, that hold us back, about being pigeonholed at an early age. I wasn't expecting to hear the strings of violins being played. That wasn't the point. I wasn't looking for sympathy. The conference organizers had requested that my presentation be hard hitting, so I didn't hold the punches. I talked about how the movement needs to work together to overcome this embedded bias and to encourage people of color into the movement. And I was approached afterwards by a senior person in the co-op movement, a very senior person who had dark hair, clear skin, a cut glass accent. The description's important. She says, your talk resonated with me. I know exactly how you feel because I have suffered the same oppression. You see, I was born in Yorkshire and our family moved to Oxfordshire when I was 12. I spoke with a thick Yorkshire accent, had ginger hair and freckles and I was bullied mercilessly. So I know exactly how you feel um, because I too have felt the same oppression. And so get her, not similar, but the same. She'd walked the road. She now has brown hair, her freckles have faded, no trace of a Yorkshire accent, but she's right up there with me in terms of daily oppression. Yeah. Um, she's remodeled herself, I'm still black, so how can our stories be the same? One of the other six black women at the conference rolled her eyes at me and said, and they wonder why we're not in the movement. I'd like to say that this is not a true story, but unfortunately it is. I wish it wasn't, but it is. So equal, achieving equal racial equality and equity and justice is not going to be easy, it's a hard task. And we're going to have to do a lot of work before we can truly answer the question, how do we communicate co-ops and community enterprise to non-traditional audiences? And the question I want to ask is, are we willing to do that work? Are you willing, you know, discuss? Thank you. Thank you so much, Dorothy. And um, yeah, I think there's a lot of, food for thought there. Um, I'm happy for people to 
jump in with some immediate reflections. Um, otherwise, I'd note down a few things that I'd be interested in exploring. Um, but I'll, I'll sort of open up if anyone has any um, immediate responses. Yeah, Ella, is that a hand? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. It's going to be very informed because maybe this would be better if I let you go first and I'd collected my thoughts a bit. But I just was reflecting. Um, thank you, Dorothy. That was that was really interesting. Um, on what you said there about um, sort of the the program that you were part of and how you felt it had failed and it didn't address the underlying causes. And I wonder if you think that there could have been a way that that program could have been set up better to address the underlying causes or if in fact that's such a big piece of work and there's so much in society that is the underlying causes that your program just couldn't have done that or couldn't have done it meaningfully um as i said this was a bit of an unformed thought so <laughs> this is making sense um or whether you think that it would have been worth trying to address some of those underlying things even if it didn't have kind of clean outcomes in the way that perhaps the program did even if those haven't borne fruit longer term does that make sense yeah, it does. And I think I would agree with you. It was, was good to do it anyway and to address it. And hopefully something came out of it. I was perhaps being a bit over dramatic when I said it was a total dismal failure. There would be what well, there were good things that came out of it. But in some ways I felt that we were sticking a sticking plaster onto an issue that was there and festering. It needed to be it needed to be let really and drained rather than us trying to put a plaster on top. So it's we need infrastructure, we need government support, we need local authority support, we need a proper um, proper philosophy of cooperation. And so, yes, we did do good. Um, there'll be people amongst here who remember it. I'm looking at Joe, for instance. I know that Joe will remember it and others. It did a good job, but it did not change the movement. Angela, did you want to come in there? Yeah, I mean, I'm really curious what is the massive difference between it being an instinctive, um, you know, response uh, to be so cooperative and and then, um, you know, culturally and then come over here. Because, I mean, that's always struck me a lot as well. You know, uh, the, the way that we set up like housing and communities and stuff like that is is very much about everybody in their own individual little boxes. And it seems like people who come from those, you know, the backgrounds where it's more, you know, takes a village to raise a child and, and sort of the whole, you know, notion of being cooperative with one another. Is it that there isn't sort of a natural space for people to, you know, to come into where maybe they can bring that ethos with them and start to perpetuate that? Because why does it suddenly close down if it's an instinctive thing you know what I mean it's, it feels to me like uh, uh, you know people from Africa and the Caribbean and 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 you know other countries should almost be able to be should be bringing their culture to us to help us to be more cooperative and that seems to be kind of quite ironic in a way that um that it can't be it can't be drum you know that that can't be extracted what do you think is the reason why that doesn't happen the other way around. I think things are just done differently here. And I think also people get closed down here. They are told that they cannot succeed. They're told we don't do it this way. They're told, for instance, black people don't ride horses or swim. Um, or you know, it's very simple things. I was told at school that black people don't swim because our bones are too heavy, so we sink. I didn't actually learn to swim until I was 22. Uh, when I took myself off to the local baths and proved that actually we don't sink. But, you know, there are so many, I talked about self-fulfilling prophecies and those self-fulfilling prophecies meet you from you from you come off the plane or the ship and they change the way that you address things. Black people are still cooperative. I mean, we uh, one, one of the areas that I often talk about is that of the informal savings schemes that nearly every person, black person of colour belongs to, Malaysian, Indian, um, Chinese, Jamaican, Nigerian, we all belong to these informal schemes, which is what we use to purchase houses, to pay, um, to 
buy furniture, to do whatever. But a lot of that was perpetuated by the fact that we simply could not get bank accounts when we came here. We were denied access to credit, to finance, legally, legitimately. It was 1976 before there was a law which was passed which says that it was wrong to discriminate against me in terms of housing, finance, education because of my skin colour. So black people came together cooperatively to deal with those issues and still do but a lot of it is behind the scenes and it's not necessarily recognized i remember i spoke at something in bristol and talked about these informal credit schemes to a group of somali people who chipped in and said yes that's how we do everything you know so and so down the road that's how he bought his new car and one of the white advisors said oh i thought he'd done that through the proceeds of drugs or something because i couldn't see how he'd got that money together to get that car it's been worrying it's been puzzling me about how he got that and i thought what a thing to say and so i, I explained this informal savings scheme which allowed him to buy that but i thought this is what you're up against a man buys a car and somebody it popped out of her mouth without her even thinking said oh i thought he must have done it through drugs or something you know this is those are the this is what stops us it's the assumptions the negativity that stops us uh, sorry, um, just if I could just quickly follow up before I pass over. Um, is it? Do you think it's a, a language thing? Do you think it's in that people don't respond to that? You know, we've decided we're going to call it the cooperative movement over here. Do you think that just doesn't mean anything? Mm. Do you think it's about calling it something that mm. people actually recognise it to be, whether it's that mutual aid saving scheme or mutual housing scheme, you know what I mean? Do you think it's just about actually reaching people by not enforcing the term cooperative on people rather than the fact mm -hmm. that they wouldn't be engaged? Anyway, I'll leave my point, but um, thank you very much. There, there is there is something of that. In my presentation, I said that when I described my job to my mom, she just said, oh, isn't that just what we do? And she <laughs> thought it was just weird that I had a job promoting a fact of what life so yeah there is that too i can see that is it calm who has a question hi yeah no great great presentation dorothy um i think one of the problems is uh obsession with formality so and in an awful lot of the world kind of cooperative behavior and networks are not necessarily formalized and institutionalized um, and in many ways the the co-op movement and in the UK, in its history, the, the, the formalization of the relationships often killed a lot of the, the collective um, organizing spirit. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's one, one, one of the reasons why I think, so when, when we talk about the solidarity economy rather than the cooperative economy, it includes an awful lot of informal networks which wouldn't mm -hmm. get on the radar. Um, in, in, if you're just thinking in terms of measuring the, the incorporated cooperative world. Um, and to, you talk about traditional kind of, um, we kind of SCA, one of the things we do is, is promote um, knowledge of cooperatives from other parts of the world. Um, so for example, Syria, um, the Kurdish co-op movement. And I think if we know more about other cultures, cooperative movements, I think that will help change how we do it here in the UK. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. I think we have much to learn. That's one of the things, what you just said, I think sums up, gets, brings me back to my mom again, which is that, she said that's also codified you know i talked about the rochdale principles and everything and i went through them with her and i said these are the principles and she said yeah that's how it is of course it's democratic of course it's one person one but of course everybody's involved but she wouldn't have said that she worked in cult she tells me stories of how you dig a field for instance how you farm you farm collectively you all come together you have a you literally have a field day where you all dig each other's you dig you'll all come together and dig my field today tomorrow we'll all go to come together and we'll dig simon's field and we'll do that until all the fields are dug and planted collectively we want to raise a house we will literally raise the roof together we will raise that house together everybody will come together to do that you want to save for a particular reason well you'll save in what in in jamaica we call a partner in other places they call susu in a lot in much of asia they call committee but there will be an informal scheme where you save to do what you want but it is all very informal and when you come over here and it's so codified it can often be off-putting to people and also it's getting into it 
is getting into it, being accepted into it and into that movement because it's now described as a movement and you need to get through the front door and you're having difficulty getting through the door full stop. It's not quite as bad as it was before when you literally could not get through a door because there were signs on it saying no blacks, dogs or Irish, but you're still trying to get through that door and there's still sometimes those metaphorical signs which are stopping you from getting through. If I was, is it right to come in? I, I just wanted to extend that point around the fact that there is, you know, you know, naturally there is a lot of informal, mutual and community led activity um, that's being missed, you know, in different ways. And I, you know, part of, you know, thinking about what's the sort of the, what are the fundamental sort of negative, like the opportunity costs of that. And to me, it's that the funding landscape and the support landscape because it's because it's not it's not recognized within those formal structures it means that there's a massive opportunity cost that those networks and communities don't get the support that other communities do because they don't mobilize they don't define themselves in the same ways and as a result you know they i would say either they potentially don't realize their full potential in terms of supporting livelihoods and you know other economic benefits to communities and they and you know they potentially exist in a slightly precarious form and i suppose that's you know one thing as a practitioner i suppose and thinking and obviously recently uh left cops uk is you know how do we how do we you know as practitioners in the infrastructure make sure that when funding and support becomes available because we know it's you know limited at the best of times how do we you know ensure that that it's best configured to ensure that we engage and um, sort of uh, identify those groups that you know are doing fantastic things but get missed out, um, you know, out of the programs. Joe, I don't know, you wanted to come in there. Well, yeah, it's just kind of to, to to sort of follow up on that, and and it's how do we twist the infrastructure that we're we're based in. It sort of mm -hmm. touches on Colm's point as well. Is Whenever you do a program, they think, oh, I know, we'll drop some co-op development people in there. And actually, what will they'll spit out at the other end will be X number of co-ops. But that's not how life works. And that's actually not, you know, that's that's doomed to failure to begin with. And that's because we only recognise co-ops who've gone through the registration process and they've got all these processes in the system rather than recognising, I think, sometimes that it looks like a co-op, it behaves like a co-op. Or do you know what? it's a co-op and and i think that's where we 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 fail i think to engage with as wide an audience as we should be um i don't have any of the answers i just have some of the scars of those schemes that say you've got to create 10 co-ops in three years and i go i'm not going to create 10 co-ops in three years but i and i don't know how we we change that but i think it's really important that when we are talking to to those who hold the purse strings or, or control the things that, that we push back, that it's not about how many we've spat out at the other end, it's actually about how we've built communities to do it for themselves. You know, mm -hmm. a successful job is where actually I'm no longer needed um, because, you know, actually I, you know, I, they, they, they don't need me anymore, that's, that's success. Mm -hmm. I think that's yeah um and uh, sorry Ella, i can see your hands up i just wanted to um add to that that i think i i think there's a, a potentially worrying tendency that funders get obsessed with this idea of community and public benefit at the expense of mutual benefit and i think mm -hmm. a lot of groups mobilize around supporting each other um and i think that potentially is you know a stronger sense of that amongst um uh, black communities and ethnic minority communities and yet you know they can't access funding because that whole mutual principle gets lost in this kind of obsession that there needs to be broader public benefit and that I would say you know is something that comes medium term long term and actually it's we need to be more comfortable in the short term that people mobilize around this more mutual interest and uh, yeah and that's something that I'm you know interested to hear people's thoughts on anyway sorry Ella I'll let you jump in as well. 
you're just a bit of amusing, really. I think I always get into these conversations and end them by thinking that we just need to scrap the world and start again, but that's not very practical. So um, maybe something that I was thinking about was, um, you know, I think these thoughts have been swirling around for a really long time in funder circles, but I think the last year, the kind of the um, renewed visibility of the Black Lives Matter movement and also the pandemic and everything that's meant for sort of the way that funding works. I've been in lots of conversations where there's been a bit of a, a rabbit in the headlight moment for funders of like, oh, we really do need to work out how we fund in a way that really gets to people that need it. And, you know, the people who are less likely to get that might be from black or other minoritized communities. And I think there's an opportunity now because I do think that the wheels will start turning again very soon, if not already, of people kind of getting back into their swing of things and their habit because, you know, things are maybe going to normalize a bit or get into new normal and things processes will just pick up and it will carry on whereas um i think that there's always a bit of an issue with charitable funders especially funding co-ops even the ones that have all the processes in place so that's one kind of hurdle but um i wonder if there's opportunities and i don't know if i'm being really naive here for sort of people promoting co-ops and the kind of co-ops that we're talking about you know that aren't necessarily formalized but would really benefit from the extra support that's available if only they could they could get it um, to kind of try and speak to that funding sector and, and just raise the awareness of, of things that are happening and, and the good, the mutual good and the public good that's being done and try and work with them to find ways to get that money there because I feel like there might be more of a willingness now to experiment than there might have been before and there might be after. So I don't know. I don't know if that's a thing, but perhaps it's a feeling that I'm getting from some of the conversations that I've been in. Thanks, Ella. Dorothy, did you any thoughts on that in response to those points before? Because I think we've only got a few more minutes. Okay. In fact, we've got 118 seconds. <laughs> okay, and I was staying quiet because I've done lots of talking, so I didn't want to keep yeah. interjecting because other people have things to put in. I think it is time for a change. I think it is time that we recognise, as Joe said, and as Ella's just said, that there are many informal ways of working in cooperative. I always think that co-ops and co-ops co should be a verb, not a noun. It's not just a description of something, it's what you do. And we should think of co-ops as a verb. It's about what people do, it's how communities operate. We should look at, I share Joe's frustration because I work in a similar organization to Joe. We're not just there to churn out numbers and to tick. Uh, we, we might not get the 10 co-ops in three years, but what we will get is change communities. We'll get people who are empowered, people who understand better how they can take hold of their of democracy and use that for their own communities. And that is cooperation. Cooperation should be low key. It should be there in the background, running in the background like a program, keeping things ticking over. And if you get an outcome, which is a registered cooperative, uh, then all to the better. But what we're looking at here really, I think, is better and more cooperative communities and cooperatives that operate as verbs, not as nouns, which is where we're getting, that's the sticking point that we need to get past. Great, thank you so much, Dorothy. And I, I really like the idea of co-op should be low key. I think that's a, a good sentiment to carry with us because I think we do get a bit um, distracted by the hype of you know, being groundbreaking and that distracts us. So. Thanks everyone for, 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 for attending. Um, we're gonna have a bit of time back as the, the overall group in a matter of seconds. So we'll, uh, I'll catch you on the other side. Um, and thanks again, Dorothy. Thank you.